Krista, I am so excited to talk to you today all about Just In Case Clutter. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about this too, especially Just In Case. So, yeah. Well, why don't we start by you telling us who you are, what you do. Spoiler alert, listener, she has a podcast. And so I really also want to know, why on earth did you start a podcast? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm, first of all, super excited to talk to you. Um, because you're another podcaster, obviously, but we talk about similar things. So I am a mom of five and teach moms how to declutter so that it's easier to live in their homes day to day, right? Because when you have a lot of kids or any kids at all, you have less time to actually manage the stuff inside of your house. So I started the podcast because back in 2017, I was pregnant with our fourth baby, and I was a part of a due date group where we did these live, but we were, we were pregnant together and we got bored and we're like, let's show each other our houses. <laughs> and so we would go live. And when it got to be my turn, they were all like, wait a second, like, how do you have four kids, a baby? And like, where's all the, where's all your stuff? Like, where's all the messes? Like, did you stage this? What's going on? Um, and it was then that I realized um, that we lived kind of differently than most people because rewind a little bit more. In 2013, we moved from Alaska to Florida with only one suitcase each when we only had three kids. And I discovered by accident that living with less is so helpful as a mom. Um, and then I spent about four years just living that way. And it was perfect because then all of a sudden I had something really great to offer my friends who I cared about and were struggling in their homes. And so I would do live videos inside of our Facebook group and just help them get rid of their stuff um, and kind of walk them through the process of like, especially just in case, that was the one of the biggest things was like, I have four kids and we got rid of all of this stuff and we never reaccumulated it. And so you really don't need it just in case. And the podcast came about because everybody would be searching for old videos and they couldn't find it. And so the podcast allowed me to be more structured and keep them all in one place and plan it a little bit more, you know, effectively so that people could find it and search for it and and listen just like on repeat everything that they needed in one place. So that's how the podcast came to be. Hmm. Well, you said something there that hit me, which was that a lot of your mom friends needed help, especially with the just in case clutter. And I think everybody struggles with just in case clutter. But I feel as though as a mom, moms are especially prone to this because we wouldn't want to get rid of something that could be useful down the line for our next child or, um, you know, maybe this toy still has a little bit of life in it. So let's hold on to it just in case uh, one of the kids is bored one day. I feel like with motherhood and as a mother is being in charge of a household, the just in case clutter can fall into a lot of traps associated with parenting. But oh, at least that's how it is in my life. I've, I'm really great about decluttering the just in case stuff that's mine and my husband's. But when it comes to my kids, like, oh, but they might need it and I don't want to spend more money rebuying it. So what do I do? I just store it in the basement. <laughs> so let's start there. Tell us, first of all, for anybody who doesn't know what just in case clutter is, what is it and how can it manifest itself in our homes. Yeah. So just in case clutter, really, it covers a, a wide range of things. But basically, if you find yourself saying anything like, I want to get rid of this, but what if I need it? Right. Or I want to get rid of this, but I'm going to keep it just in case this event happens and then I could use it. Right. So it's, it's mostly a hesitation on our part, not wanting to get rid of something because we see potential value in it in the future whether that potential value is likely to happen or not. Or, you know, even if the event does happen, not really seeing clearly that we have, you know, we're perfectly equipped with everything that we need already. So we don't have to keep all of it. And to your point about it being a lot more difficult for parents, I have um, a good and I think unique experience because in Alaska, before we moved to Florida, we had three kids. And we had a boy, a girl, and then a boy. 
and I had saved everything. I saved all of the clothes, and not only did I save all of the stuff that I purchased or, you know, was given, um, I saved everything that everybody else gave me, all of the clothes, all of the toys, all of the, the gadgets and the gear, just in case we ever had more kids again. And it was a lot of, it was a lot of stuff. And when we left Alaska and moved to Florida, even though I knew that we weren't going to have any kids in the near future, and even though I knew that it was way more expensive to ship that stuff from Alaska to Florida than to repurchase it when we got there, it was still really hard. I think just because in a lot of ways we are wired to survive, and it's a form of survival to make sure that we have these things. But we also live in a unique time where our survival needs are different, right? It's not like needing a, all of these different bouncers or gadgets or whatever it might be. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think what you're hitting on there is that there are underlying reasons why so many of us keep the just-in-case clutter around. You mentioned, I believe you said, essentially like a fear of scarcity is what I would assume you're saying. We we fear that moment where we all of a sudden need that third ladle or... <laughs> or that panini press, or whatever the thing can can be. What are some of the other underlying reasons why we keep just-in-case stuff around, in your opinion? Um, I mean, a lot of it comes back to, like, childhood. Maybe it's guilt, right? Like, people gave us something, and so we keep it just in case it might offend them or hurt them if we get rid of it. It could be guilt. It could be feelings of obligation. It could be, you know, not wanting to upset your kids, right? And then kind of entangling our own just in case worries or fears or whatever you want to call it with our kids own versions of their, you know, their just in case. Like, what if I get rid of something and it was their favorite? Or if what if I get rid of something and it could have benefited them in some educational way? Um, there's just so many ways that it can go for just in case. But the other thing that I wanted to share is that we had those first three kids where I had the experience of saving everything, keeping everything, it not being organized. And so even despite having all of those things, still needing to go get things that I couldn't find or forgot about or lost or it got ruined because it wasn't stored adequately. I had that experience. And then when we had our last two kids, they're six years apart. The last two kids were post decluttering for us. And I just got to see firsthand how little you actually need for especially small babies and how even more importantly the more kids I have the less stuff I can manage and so I found myself really resistant to even getting a lot of like baby toys or baby gear or toddler gear first of all knowing that they outgrow it so quickly but also knowing that having all of that stuff in my house might be a potential convenience but mostly it's probably just going to be more work for me, <laughs> like more to clean up, more to store and make life a lot harder. And it was awesome. It was so much easier to have less baby gear and less overall stuff with when I had the last two babies. It's going on your example of, you know, kids stuff. And there is a line that that line is different for each of us, but there is a line where you have too much stuff. I know with my children, you know, I have two girls. So I, want, I saved all of the first child's clothes for the second child. Like, I don't want to be wasteful. I'm not going to get rid of it and then rebuy. That doesn't sound right to me at all. Um, but then I also acquired hand-me-downs for both children. And so now I have so much clothes in so many different sizes. And there is a line in which I cannot manage all the clothes in all the different sizes anymore. Just the other day, I was packing away my daughter's winter stuff, looking at to head to the spring stuff and realized I completely missed a box of, of winter stuff. I didn't put it out because I forgot I had it because, you know, my mental space is finite. I cannot manage all the things, all the bins, all the boxes, all the clothes. And so a box of winter clothes fell through the cracks. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering though, you know, my listeners are very unique in that they keep just in case, just in case clutter around because number one, they don't want to be wasteful, right? We're, we're not on the show about just like want being wanton wasteful. 
And number two, I would say, if I had to guess, they don't want to waste money, right? They want to keep something so that they don't have to then go out and and spend their hard-earned money a second time on something that they already have. Can you speak to either of those at all? Yes. Yeah. So I've, I've been taking notes as you're talking too. So I think it kind of all pulls in from these little things that I want to talk about. But first, what you said is that everybody has their own threshold of what they can manage, right? What they can keep track of, what they can store. And that's based on both your home size, like what you actually have room for, but also just, you know, your personality and how you're wired, like how much can you actually keep track of? Um, For some people, like myself, it's so low. Like, and I don't know if it's because I have so many kids or if it's just like who I am, but I really, like, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind for me. And so for the most part, when it comes to switching out our, our seasonal gear, I need it in our everyday closets, at least over to the side, so that I don't forget about it. Because I will forget about it. And then I'll go buy more. And that ends up being more wasteful, because it's like, well, I had all of this stuff. I just forgot where it was, and I forgot that we even had it. And so... For me, just buying in small amounts that I know I can fit into our everyday spaces helps me with that part. And it's, you know, it's trial and error a little bit to figure out what your own threshold is. But um, I actually did a podcast episode, a couple podcast episodes with my grandma of all people because she was a, she was really good at this. She was really good at being in touch with what her family needed as far as, you know, clothing and food, especially. I think food is one thing that is really easy to get caught up in, you know, just in case. And then we store it and we keep it and it goes bad before we can get to it. Um, But the thing that she taught me as an adult that I know she was teaching me when I was little too, I just didn't realize it, is that (laughs) figure, you know, figure out what you use on a daily basis. And What stuck out to me that she said is like, if you can't get through your days, you know, knowing what you're using and how much you're using and what you need, you really can't plan ahead for the future because it's going to be skewed. And so her recommendation that she gave to my audience was to don't try to plan, you know, a month or three months in advance yet. Just get through a day, get really clear on basically the inventory that you use. Like, what are your kids actually wearing? Because a lot of times our thresholds we get a, a skewed perspective of what we can manage and what we actually need and use because we're used to being around so much. So take some time to get some clarity on what you actually use and how much you actually use. And then from there, you can start to declutter you know, the things that really are not being used and definitely could be used by somebody else outside of your home you know, by donating it or selling it or however it is that you want to redistribute it. And that will help you get to the root of the waste, which is overconsumption in the first place. And it's, you know, a, it's a big subject, but the reason that we end up being wasteful usually is because of overconsumption in the first place. And we don't do it on purpose. We have the best of intentions. We just get, we live in this society where it's like anything you want, as soon as you want it in whatever quantity you want it in. And that really does skew our perspective. So just taking some time to get familiar with with that. Well, I love your grandmother. I'd like to meet you and her. She sounds like a lovely lady. Uh, <laughs> well, as you were speaking there, I had the thought, you know, I'd out of sight, out of mind. That's a platitude we hear all the time. And it's especially true for me. If I can't see what I have on hand, whatever it may be, we've been talking about kids clothes. So let's just continue with that example. But If I can't see what I have, if I have boxes in the attic or boxes in the basement, I'm going to forget about the stuff that's out of sight. If it's out of my sight, it's out of my mind, and then I cannot adequately manage the clothes. And so I'm wondering whether, you know, you mentioned that you're keeping your children's clothes, all the clothes in the closet. I'm wondering if part one aspect of the solution is, you know, enforcing boundaries. So clothes go in closets, clothes do not go in boxes and attics. Maybe if we're going to continue on with this clothes example, maybe the solution is keeping all the clothes for the child in their age group, regardless of the season, 
regardless of the occasion, fancy, not fancy, maybe it's keeping it all in one place. And that's just a thought for me personally. As we talk about just in case clutter, I do feel as though it's really important to distinguish that there is a difference between being adequately prepared for whatever, for some future event, versus being overprepared. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that distinction. How have you determined what's preparedness versus what's overpreparedness for you personally in your own home with five children? Yeah. So we can just stick with the clothes example to keep it really simple. Um, and going back to what my grandma said is she would talk about like food preparedness and, and things like that, mostly like disaster preparedness. And her point was that if you can't, if you can't get through your everyday life, you know, with simplicity and ease and knowing where things are, knowing where things go in the event of an emergency, no matter how much stuff you have, it doesn't really matter because you, you don't know where your everyday stuff is. And so clothing, for example, I used to keep it all. Like once my kids outgrew it, I put it into a box and it got left in that box indefinitely. And I thought I was being prepared, right? Because I've got all these things just in case we need it or when we need it or when we have another baby. But the truth was that I didn't know where it was. It wasn't organized. I really didn't have room for it in my house. And so it was piled into closets or under beds with other stuff piled on top of it. And I wasn't prepared because I wasn't making sure that I was keeping sizes for the kids that I actually had right now and attempting to, you know, predict their needs within reason. Because I think that some people can do that if you've got the bandwidth for it, predicting future seasons and sizes of clothing that your children might need. But I wasn't prepared. I just was telling myself I was prepared, right? And there's actually a mom in my community. She has nine children. And so for her, it makes a lot of sense to keep clothes for the future. And she has a lot of clothes. But she's been able to, I kind of walked her through the process, like get all of your kids their their daily or their weekly clothing, right? Or 10 days or whatever it is that she wanted to do. She got those all for them. And then she took what was left and was able to store them and take photos of them inside of Trello. It's just like kind of an organization app. Um, And then she was prepared and she got rid of, I think it was like 16 bags of clothing that she was keeping, thinking that she was being prepared, but then only ended up keeping a, a smaller amount so that she knew what she had, she knew where it was, and she was able to store it up in an attic. She's also an out of sight, out of mind person, but because she had stored it digitally on her phone, She would be able to refer back to it so that once her kids were growing out of their sizes, she could easily just pull out her phone and see if she had that and could, you know, fill in the gaps like, oh, they need a few more pants or they need a few more shirts. Um, So, yeah, there is a balance between actually being prepared, but it all comes down to knowing what your needs actually are and then curating your supplies, whatever that might be, clothing, dishes, toys, even to those needs and boundaries, like you said, like what's your physical space? You should always start with that. Do you even have room for it in the house you're in right now? Yes. It sounds to me as though your friend with the nine children, she put in a lot of work on the front end, digitizing all this stuff, but it paid off for her literally and figuratively. And, you know, that really brings home the point that there is a difference between being prepared for whatever we're envisioning in the future versus just accepting and holding on to a lot of stuff. There's a big difference between actually being prepared and just having a lot of stuff. And I think that your answer there really makes clear that distinction. So we're moving on to, you know, the the how-to portion of this conversation, which is how can listeners who are listening right now who have a lot of just-in-case clutter how can they sift through it all in a practical and intentional way without just without being wasteful? Um, I know you mentioned asking yourself questions. What are those questions? <laughs> yeah. So I actually have a little just in case workshop that we can, we'll just basically go through it here with you all in the episode. Um, and you can apply this to nearly any category in your home. But the very first question 
And if you're listening, I would, I would, I wish I could see you to see if you nod your head yes or no. Um, but the very first question is, do I need it? Because your knee-jerk reaction is probably yes, right? Or maybe. So if you ask yourself, do I need this? And your answer is yes or maybe. Ask yourself when. And even further than just like, when would I need this? Because, you know, for example, if it's, if it's clothing, I'm going to need this when my kids grow into it, um, which might be true. A follow-up question to that would be, do you really need this much? Probably not. There's Crock-Pots and Instapots is a fun one to talk about, too, because everyone's got their strong opinions about those. Um, but, you know, I ask people, too, sometimes, like, if you have a Crock-Pot and an Instapot and a rice cooker and whatever else kind of gadget there might be that does something similar, do you really need all of these? And is if there's if there's ever a moment where you need all of them, what's going to happen? <laughs> and you don't have them. Like, do you ever use all four of those gadgets at the same time? Do you have room for them? Are you overwhelmed by them? And if you don't have, or like my friend, um, she's in, in the Motherhood Simplified community too. We have like this ongoing joke of like, she has three crock pots and she she never uses them all at once, right? Like, is there ever a moment where something catastrophic is going to happen because you don't have three crock pots. <laughs> and if you can look at it just a, 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 like a little bit lighthearted of a way like that, instead of feeling like, because it can feel really intense, right? To feel like, oh my gosh, what if I need it and I get rid of it and I don't have it. But just really play out the scenario. Like when specifically would you need all of this and how would you even use it? And if you didn't have it and you needed it, what would happen, right? Like what would you do? Could you borrow it? Could you use something else? Could you cook that food on the stove? Could you figure out some something else to eat? Like there are so many options. And I think the most empowering part of asking those kinds of questions is that you get to realize how resourceful you are and how much you do actually have, which goes along with that scarcity mindset. I think it's a lot easier to walk yourself through the process of what you would do instead or how you could problem solve to get past that scarcity and realize like that's the real abundance right is like trusting yourself that it'll be fine yes I love that I'm thinking about whether I would ever need three crock pots and I mean this isn't a personal example so it's really easy for me to say heck no that's never going to (laughs) happen I'm never going to be using all three of these applying appliances at once but if Let's, let's work through it. Like maybe I would one day, but if I was, it, I would be having a lot of people over for dinner. And if that's the case, then why wouldn't I just invite, ask one of them to like borrow one of their crock pots? They can bring it over, right? So I love that. It's not about holding on to a bunch of stuff. It's about believing in your problem solving abilities to know that in the event that you need three crock pots, you can acquire one by other means. And you also touched on very briefly something that I really wanted to emphasize and reiterate, which is that if you're giving a crock pot, one of your three crock pots to somebody else, that is an eco-friendly practice because theoretically you are preventing that person who accepts your crock pot from purchasing a new one, from uh, taking the non-renewable resources from our earth to, you know, create a new crock pot. You are sharing your wealth, literally. (laughs) So I think that's important to say, like if, if you have crock pots in your basement, sorry, if you're, if you have crock pots in your basement that are just collecting dust, um, you would be serving somebody else by passing it along. And by the way, crock pots, just like with almost anything in 2022 is a dime a dozen. If you need something in a pinch, you can, you can find it. You can swipe right on Amazon then, or you can ask your local buy nothing group. So I love that. But I do think that when people are decluttering I mean, making difficult decisions about what to keep versus what to responsibly pass on, they get stuck in what you call the analysis paralysis trap. Talk to me about this trap. What does it feel like when we're in it and how on earth do we get out of it? Yeah, so the analysis paralysis, when we get in it, we are thinking of all of the potential scenarios that things might benefit us and 
for me, what it feels like is like getting stuck in my head, right? I'm just thinking about everything. I'm thinking about all of the reasons to keep this. I'm thinking about all of the things that could go wrong if I don't keep this. I could, I'm thinking about all of the opportunities my kids will miss out on if I get rid of these toys. And you're really stuck in your head. And what I've found to be true for me and what I've seen happen for a lot of the other moms inside of the community is that that's the hardest part. The hardest part about decluttering most often is thinking about it and trying to make these decisions. And if you can get yourself out of that and just, I call it like just just one thing, like declutter just one thing and get the energy moving, like literally physically moving, just get rid of something, anything, and march it right out to your car so that you can donate it or post it immediately onto your Buy Nothing group or whatever it is that you're going to do, it starts to feel easier. And <clears throat> all of those thoughts that you had you know, circling around in your head start to kind of just go away because you're taking action and you're moving all of that energy into actually doing something instead of thinking about it. And so that's that's what I usually recommend for moms to start. If you are feeling so overwhelmed, start with something so easy, like look under your kitchen sink and get rid of some expired cleaners that you forgot were there and were buried under everything, right? Or go into your closet and choose to get rid of some clothes that have had maybe a broken button or something that you were going to sew up but never have. And it's been five years of saying that I'm going to fix this so that I can wear it and you just never do. Go ahead and drop it off at your textile recycling. Just one one little small thing that you can do to get out of your head a little bit and, and physically moving is really helpful. A lot of what you said there resonates with me. And I'm wondering whether there's some sort of connection between quite literally holding on to physical stuff versus figuratively holding on to the stuff um, because we're holding on to a an attachment for what we hope our future is like or what we want to, you know, we don't know, fear of the unknown. So we're holding on to all these items to hopefully, um, you know, gain some control over you know, what's to come in the next week, month, year. I know the minimalists have like a general rule for dealing with just in case clutter, which is the 2020 rule. If you can reacquire the item, whatever it might be, let's use a, let's use a ladle, for example. If you can, if you have three ladles, you declutter two, because how many times do you make two soups and need two ladles? Really, we only just need one ladle, let's be real. But in the event that you need two ladles, the 2020 rule states that if you can reacquire the ladle for $20 or less in 20 minutes or less, they say go ahead and declutter that item. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or do you have any tricks in your own life that you use when you're working through the real tricky items? I know a ladle might not be really tricky, really, <laughs> really difficult to deal with. But do you have any go-to rules that you use when you're dealing with a with a tricky, tricky decision? Yeah, yeah. So that is one that's talked about, you know, pretty commonly in our, our space too, in the motherhood simplified space too. And the thing that comes up for moms is that, you know, a lot of things that moms need for the, you know, like diaper or like diapers is a bad example. Hold on. Like a, a bottle, bottle or a sippy cup, right? Like that's really easy to get in 20 minutes under $20, but we still need them on hand. And so that's where moms get caught up with that. And I tell them, try to not keep it so literal, right? Use that as a guide. If it's that easy for you to replace something that you're not using, regularly. You can't remember the last time you used it or you've used it once in five years or three years even. Is it really worth keeping in your space and taking up your time and your money? And I think a good example for this for moms would be, you know, like kids toys. Like most of them you can get under $20, especially if you're buying second hand. But are you actually going to, if you if you declutter toys, are you actually going to go out and replace those? Because what I've found for me personally is that those things that are easy to get in 20 minutes or under $20, they're just things that I don't replace. If I get rid of it, it, it never comes back. And it's, it's, it's no loss to me. The one example that I do have that I get rid of every time we move because it doesn't fit whenever I pack up our kitchen is a pie pan because I like to buy the ceramic ones. And so I pack up like pots and pans and dishes and everything. 
And the thing that never fits is the pie pan. And so I end up like donating it. And then when we get to our place, I want to make like a pie or an apple crisp. And I'm like, dang it, I shouldn't have gotten rid of the pie pan. But I've done it like three times. Um, And it's really not that big of a deal. I can go get them really easy secondhand. I can ask in a buy nothing group. Um, It's also kind of what you were talking about earlier that we touched on that I think is really cool is that it brings you together as a community. Like, hey, can I borrow a pie pan from somebody? Like, that's such a good conversation starter. And I think people love it. Like, I think we could really use so much more of that kind of community. It's like, can I borrow a pie pan? I decluttered mine three times already. I haven't learned my lesson. (laughs) Like, help me out. (laughs) No, you're so right. I mean, we don't talk to each other anymore. We don't talk to our neighbors. We don't borrow, we don't borrow a cup of sugar. So, I mean, you bring up two points. Number one is lean into your community. Because if you need something, willing to bet your neighbor has it and will let you borrow it. And number two is we live in a unique time. I believe that was the phrase you used earlier, where goods are abundant. So what's the worst that could happen if you decluttered that trifle bowl or that ladle or that winter coat or whatever the item may be? Uh, the worst that can happen is that you acquire it again. Unless an item is a one-of-a-kind item, an autographed copy, a handmade thing, something really one-of-a-kind and special, there is a way in 2022 for you to get your hands back on that item. Would you agree with that? I I completely agree. I completely agree. And I try to I try to make it lighthearted and fun when I talk about this. Um, because I think we, we could use a little bit more of that, but really it brings it into perspective of like, what is, what is the worst thing that's going to happen? Like, especially with kids toys and, you know, moms who are resistant to getting rid of toys. It's like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Like they can still get into Harvard without having all of these toys, right. Or whatever it is they want to, they can still become a successful entrepreneur without all of these toys. Like you'll still be able to make dinner if you only have one crock pot. And I like to bring it back of like, it is kind of silly. Like the way that we live, we live in this time, but are wired for another time, right? (laughs) Yes, that's so right. We are wired to be hunter gatherers with an emphasis on gathering, right? Holding onto stuff. There was a time in our evolutionary history where holding onto stuff did ensure our survival. But in 2022, holding on to three (laughs) cockpots is not going to ensure our survival. Krista, tell us where my listeners can find more of you, find your podcast, find your resources, et cetera. Yeah, you can find me. um, I'm Motherhood Simplified across all platforms, the Motherhood Simplified podcast on Instagram. Um, My website is motherhoodsimplified.com. But yeah, everything's there. I would love to get to know you all. Well, I'm linking to all of it in the show notes. And I just want to thank you so much for this conversation. You know, even as the host of this podcast, I do struggle with just in case clutter, just in case clutter. So you really gave me a, you gave me some motivation to rethink the stuff I have stored in my basement that I'm holding on for one day. So thank you so much. 